Welcome, everyone, to Family Talk. It's a ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute, supported by listeners just like you. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us. Well, welcome back to Family Talk. I'm Roger Marsh, and on today's classic program, we will continue to hear some practical advice for engaged or newly married couples as Kay Coles James is back with us one more time to offer more of her refined wisdom for part two of her conversation with our own Dr. James Dobson. You know, marriage is a beautiful gift, and with God as the foundation, it can become stronger and even more splendid each and every year, even through the peaks and valleys that life will surely offer. Who better to guide a young couple in their journey than a seasoned, God-led married couple who can share biblical wisdom? It's wise to be prepared for the wide array of circumstances that will test any marriage. And having a mentor will help a young husband or wife navigate the most challenging situations that are unforeseen along the way. Kay Coles James will be sharing with us today about the importance of real mentorship, as well as insight from her book called What I Wish I Had Known Before I Got Married, Keeping It Real. Kay Coles James is the Secretary of the Commonwealth of Virginia, a position she has held since 2022. She is also the founder and chairwoman of the Gloucester Institute, which teaches leadership skills to young African Americans. Kay is the former president of the Heritage Foundation, where she served from 2018 to 2021. She earned her law degree from Pepperdine University. She and her husband, Charles James Sr., are the parents of three grown children and the grandparents of several grandkids. Let's join Kay Coles James and Dr. James Dobson right now for their continuing conversation on today's classic edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. You know, we covered a lot of good stuff last time, and we're going to dive right into the thick of things today. And uh, Kay, let me start with this. Um, there are 50 different issues in your book that we could talk about and certainly begin with today. What kind of advice do you offer to young women who are preparing for marriage? I'm not talking about, um, you know, the wedding and the flowers and the bridesmaids dresses and all that. I'm, I'm talking about getting themselves ready for the experience of marriage. How do you do that? Well, as a woman, I have to tell you that all of those other things we just mentioned are very important. It's oh, very yeah. important no. what color those no, bridesmaid dresses are. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it, it stands as an example for us if we put all of that time and effort and energy and money into something that's going to last a few hours to prepare for that, do we spend near enough time preparing for something that's going to last a lifetime? And I don't think that we do in this country. Well, there were several things and. Truly, Charles was the author of the list, and those were the list of things that uh, he felt uh, Busy and Brandon uh, needed to do in preparation. Uh, while I was covering those details, the, the calligrapher and the bridesmaid's dresses, Charles sort of took on the task of getting them prepared emotionally and spiritually. And one of the things he said is, before you all get engaged, I want you to have counseling. And one of the reasons for that is that the engagement is in and of itself a covenant. And, you know, it's a commitment and you've given your word. And so before you get to that point, you know, then all you want the pastor to do is say, we've decided to do this yeah. and we just want you to help now us. put your blessing yeah, on Yeah, put your blessing on us and, and make it work. So he insisted that they have pre-engagement counseling. And so that was one of the things that we recommended. We also said that, you know, sweetheart, there are people who've loved you your entire life, who know you better than you know yourself. It's important that they get to know your mm -hmm. potential spouse. We didn't want on the wedding day at a crowded reception for people to meet Brandon for the first time. Yeah. So one of the things Charles said they needed to do was to go back to our home church, spend time with friends, spend time with family so that they would get to know him and give her the benefit of their insights and their thoughts and their wisdom. Probably one of the most poignant times was Thanksgiving when our Charles's grandfather, who was in his 90s, said, come here, boy, <laughs> sit down. And uh, he scared said, I want to scare him to death, <laughs> told him to sit down. And that man 
imparted wisdom to him like you would not believe. Old folks know some stuff. (laughs) And uh, by the grace of God, one of the family members had a video camera, and we were able to sneak it over and sit it it down. We got it on tape. We we certainly did. And, And, you know, the wisdom of the elders in your life is so critical and so important. Then after engagement, uh, there was premarital counseling, where it was a little bit more specific and a little bit more pointed uh, in terms of some of the questions and, and some of the things that they were to work through. So I think those were some of the steps that yeah. we asked them to go through. You uh, you talked in this book about uh, a concept that's interesting to me. You call it preventative care. <laughs> yes. What do you mean by that? Well, when I was Secretary of Health in Virginia, one of the things that I always talked about was prevention. You know, it's, it's far better to prevent a disease yeah. or a problem or an illness than it is to try to cure it once it's there. And I think that principle applies to marriages as well, that we should put some things in place that will help us to prevent problems that may come down the road. As an example, uh, we we recommend that before you have your first big knockdown drag out fight that, that you just can't seem to get around, that together you all agree uh, who you're going to go to and whose wisdom and counsel you will seek. So that before you're into a problem situation like that, you identify that person. We go back over the basics. You know, we tell them that you, you got to be involved in a local church. I don't mean just attend a church where you go for Sunday morning services. You need to be involved in a church where people know you, they are involved in your lives, where they can hold you accountable. When you're involved in a small group, when the problems start creeping up, you have the relationships in place Including with people who know a you. mentor relationship. Absolutely. You can't overstate that. I, can I, I really strongly encourage every young woman to be involved in a relationship where she is mentoring someone younger and she is being mentored by someone older. And uh, that certainly was helpful to me. I can remember one time being so annoyed and frustrated and angry with Charles, and I just wanted out. And I called one of my mentors, and and uh, she said, honey, come on over. Let's talk. She didn't get upset. She didn't, you know, panic. And she just recognized it for what it was. And, you know, I cried on her shoulder. She talked me through it showed me where I was wrong in a very loving way (laughs) and sent me back in. So I very much encourage that kind of relationship. We need women to women relationships. You can't do this by yourself. You need a woman you can pick up the phone and call and say, let me tell you what he did today. Mm -hmm. And she listens. And then you can call her back two hours later and say, oh, let me tell you what he did today Mm -hmm. because he's the sweetest thing. And that's year after year. That's not just the first year year of marriage. I mean, uh, for those that are 30 and 35 and 40, they can still benefit from someone who's a little older, and that's Titus too, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. You just can't isolate yourself. Um, you know, we, we were not made to be Lone Ranger Christians. God, you know, created us for fellowship and to be involved in those kinds of relationships. And I can tell you that they have kept us out of so much mm-hmm. trouble. People who will get in your face, people mm-hmm. who will be honest with you, people who will help you to keep it real. Um, and I thank God for the, the people who've been that for me in my life over the years. And sometimes you don't want to hear what they have to say, but boy, uh, does it help. One of the uh, words of advice that I have offered to women, this is not particularly unique, uh, you say it too, Kay, uh, is that uh, a man cannot meet all of a mm-hmm. woman's need package. I mean, right. he can't. He's not geared for it. I mean, she needs something that he can't provide. She needs women friends. She needs that outlet. Women do something for one another that a man cannot provide, and then he provides something they can't. And it's, it works vice versa, too. Uh, um, a man needs his friends. It sure know. does. And, you know, in the early days uh, when I was struggling with three young kids at home and it seemed impossible to have a life of my own, I mean, you couldn't even find time to 
to take a nap or, or to go take a shower without three kids banging on the, the <laughs> bathroom door to be let in. It seems almost impossible advice, but I, you know, it's amazing when you make it a priority how creative you can be. I can remember on more than one occasion uh, Charles coming home, and it had been one of those stressed out days, and I met him at the door and handed him the baby, handed him to the key, the keys, and went to the library to read a book. And I wasn't gone long. <laughs> I was only gone an hour and a half. You knew you'd had it. I you? knew I'd had it, but I took that time to read something that I was yeah. interested in. And I encourage, and that's one of the things in prevention, I encourage women to keep up their interest, uh, to read, take a class. You're a far more interesting wife. And incidentally, uh, it also has a, a, another side effect uh, one woman told me that she maintained her, her license and she took classes and kept up her f- professional license. Little did she know that in her future was a, an accident where her husband was killed. Mm. And as a result of that, because she had kept up her professional license, because she had read and because she had maintained a certain amount of currency, and she had something, to fall, she had back something on. to fall back on. Uh, Kay, you have uh, counseled a lot of young women uh, through the years. Um, and with the phenomenon of divorce and family disintegration today, you find a, a lot of them are uh, frightened because they've seen such a bad marriage at home. They've seen such conflict. They've seen a divorce. They've seen custody battles. They've seen it all. And they're afraid to commit to a marital relationship because they've never seen anything else. They don't know that it can work. And unfortunately, unfortunately, many of the young women that I've talked to have seen it and seen it in Christian marriages. Yeah. Oh, that really yeah. grieves me. Uh, and so they are frightened and and they are afraid to make uh, that. You know, you, you used to find that it was just the guys who were afraid to make commitment. But there are many young women out there who are afraid to take that step. Uh, that's not the God we serve. Uh, he is not a mm-hmm. God of fear, a uh, God of anxiety, and he is able. Uh, having said that, I think we're absolutely right to be uh, go into it with eyes wide open, recognizing that uh, we need to be vigilant to protect and nurture and keep and grow our marriages. What do you say to the couple that disagrees uh, with regard to children? One of them wants them, the other one doesn't. Ooh, there's a piece of advice I give way back pre-marriage, which is somewhat controversial, I've been told, and that mm-hmm. is um, if you're not ready to have children, then don't get married. Ooh. Mm-hmm. And the because reason I you say can that never be sure that's that exactly you're right. Them. I know too many people who have gotten pregnant on honeymoons, <laughs> and so a, a lot of young women that I know take issue with that. And my point is simply this: it can and does happen. And if there's some reason why you um, you just don't want to have children right away, where it would be devastating, where your lives would be ruined. It's probably a good idea to postpone the marriage. Didn't you have that conversation with Busy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's when she backed away from the table as well. (laughs) (laughs) Because she said, I'm not ready for that. Maybe three or four years down the road, and I don't want to have kids right away. And I said, sweetie, you got to be prepared for that. It can happen. Uh, So those who say that they can have uh, a career and, and not be impeded, Ooh. By not having Ooh. children, <laughs> talk about uh, <laughs> talk about the career versus the full time homemaker. There are no easy answers there. There are none, and I had to struggle with this because I knew of too many poor people who had no options. Yes, who had to work outside the home. Your mother was one of them. Wasn't she? Absolutely, my mother was indeed one of those women, and so I really struggled with that to say, well, well, God, if that's the case, then then are you saying that any mother who has to be put in that situation is then uh, putting her kids at risk somehow? You know, but I, I believe in a gracious God who loves us and works out the details of our life. And so I think, Jim, that there's some hard and difficult questions that must be asked, but we must do it honestly. I found that when uh, making decisions about returning to work, very often it is financial and it's quality of life. Mm-hmm. It is whether we can improve our quality of life, we can have a little more, we can do a little more, and it really isn't for uh, necessity or, or subsist, you know, living at a subsistence level. Okay, there's a third. 
Hmm. I wonder if you've seen it, and I'm almost reluctant as a man to say this. You could say it more easily. But I think some women want to work because it is quieter. There's less um, wear and tear on the nerves. Uh, <laughs> an office uh, is easier in some ways than having all these little children pulling on you. Uh, now, having, some, I'm going to get in trouble for that. Having but. been guilty of that very thought <laughs> myself, <laughs> I remember during a, a rather uh, hectic holiday season recently, my children are all uh, adult children now, but they were all all home uh, for the holiday, and I had the day off, and quite frankly, I decided to go to work that day because it was quieter. <laughs> I could really get more done, and I and so I know that that phenomena exists, but I can tell you this. Um, I talk in my first book about my daughter, uh, who is the, the one that this book was written for and to, when she was four years old, uh, became critically ill and was lying in a hospital bed, and Charles and I looked up and saw a straight line on the monitor. And at that moment, I never regretted one day of staying home. I never regretted taking the time to bake the cookies, to go on the walks. I never regretted that we didn't have enough money for me to have new clothes. I wore Charles's clothes because we couldn't afford his jeans and his mm. big baggy shirts because we couldn't afford clothes for me. Uh, and I never regretted any of that at that moment. You can't substitute time uh, for, for money. You just can't. And, uh, you know, I thought of that and, and the, when I was sitting on the front pew uh, of the church when Charles was giving away our daughter. I mean, that concept. I mean, what are you, I, mean, I yeah. sat there thinking, what are you doing? You're giving away our daughter. What are you thinking? Um, I thought back to those early years that we'd had together and I would not have traded one day of it. I, I believe that as women, we can have it all, just not all at the same time. And if we trust God with the ordering of our lives, there's time and, you know, there's, there's places for all of that. And yes, I was a a businesswoman at the time and involved in corporate America. And there were many people who advised, if you give up your job and come home, you're going to have a hard time breaking back in. And I've heard that line used on me, you know, in, in yeah, subsequent years. It doesn't years. work with you. No, That's it doesn't. <laughs> and, I, and I tell them, if you're all that, if you're as good yeah. as you think you are, there's always a market for that kind of talent. You will break back in and it will not be a problem. You're but really kind of not only affirming the mother at home, but you're saying if given a choice at all, that's what you would recommend. Oh, no question about it. I would not have traded one second of that time. Not one second of it. You do realize you're stirring guilt in the mix for those uh, who have chosen something but different. You know... I think that that's something that every woman has to go before her God and be honest about. We must have intellectual integrity here because I have respect for women who have no other options and they must do this. There's single women out there who are raising three and four kids and have no other option. And, you know, there's something called grace. In those situations, God gives us grace to cover uh, those situations. I don't think he gives us grace to cover greed. I don't think he gives us grace to cover materialism. I don't think he gives us grace to cover selfishness. And so, you know, if you are in that situation where you are bound to work, where it must be, uh, it's a situation where you must, you know, provide for your family, I think God's grace is sufficient. Uh, Kay, quite honestly now, you have been involved in government at the highest level. I mean, you've served two presidents. You are a frequent visitor at the White House uh, on business, and you have had the acclaim, and you've had the roar of the crowd and the smell of the <laughs> grease paint. You have been a speaker. You're an author. You've got three books. Does any of that compare with what you experienced with those three kids? Doesn't even come close. Not even close. Is this propaganda? Not is propaganda. This, this, this is real? heartfelt. I, I keep it real. I don't know how to do it any other way. And when I talk about this and I talk about it with such a passion, it's it's because of the the joy, the love, the you know, the fulfillment 
that comes with being a mom and being a wife that for people that I love, I covet that for them. Do you would, say this to the young women? Oh, absolutely. Do you absolutely. say this to those that have been married one or two or three years? Absolutely. And particularly when they're in that stage of marriage where they just can't see it. It's not there for them. It's not happening. And, and, and I know. I've been there, too. I understand what that feels like, and it's not good. But the problem is that so many young people are, are used to not working at something. Marriage is hard. <laughs> it's hard, and it's hard work. It is. And sometimes it can be painful to go through situations with husbands and kids. And, you know, I heard those words, but I didn't think they meant it was going to hurt that much or be that hard. Now, being alone is painful, too. Oh, I mean, well, life yes. Life is pain. Yeah, there you go. There you go. And so as a result of that, you know, I I am very cognizant of the fact that as I talk to people that you have to tell them that if they press it through, if they work it through, if they stick at it, the joy comes. You know, I know so many of my friends who, when Charles and I were struggling in the early days of marriage, would say, I wouldn't put up with that for a minute. Why do you take that? And, and you mm-hmm. know, going on and on. And now, when they call us Claire and Cliff Huxtable, you know, <laughs> and the fact that we have such joy and, and enjoy each other, love each other so much, we've earned it. <laughs> okay, you got one uh, fun funny uh, recommendation in here. It's funny to me, and it is the <laughs> the notion that uh, men and women communicate differently. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> oh, golly day. <laughs> that is something that young couples need to know. I had no idea. All of that Mars, Venus stuff, yeah. communicating, it's real. It's true. <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that really Charles and I had to work through were the elements of how to talk to each other. He didn't realize that he came through as so stern and the you know not only what you say i used to tell him all the time it's not just what you say it's the way what you say it <laughs> that's so important to me this is funny too at the back of your book you have two contrasting lists one from the 1950s and the other from modern times about what it takes to be a good wife and there's some humorous stuff in there that i won't take the time to read but the truth of the matter is that some of that old advice wasn't all that bad well you know some of the women from the 50s although they laughed and made fun of them and and you know came under much derision the, the reality is that there's some solid good advice in there but it has to be updated and modernized right. because we live in a totally different culture and a totally different world. And women today are faced with so many more pressures, opportunities, stresses. The women's movement has opened up so much uh, in, a, in a positive way. Yes. Jim, now I'm going to say a shocker for your audience. I think Christian women ought to lead the feminist movement, by the way. Huh. Absolutely, because we ought to define it. And uh, we are the ones who say, you know, we're glad we're women. God made us women. We're proud of what all that means. And we don't have to be like men to be equal to anybody. Oh, man, that's, that's pretty good <laughs> stuff. <Yeah. laughs> well, I think uh, that Christian women have a lot that we can share and show uh, for the world. But women are looking for answers. Hmm. They really are. Kay, it's always good to have you here. The title of the book is What I Wish I'd Known Before I Got Married. Uh, If you have a young person or are one uh, in that period of life um, thinking about engagement or you are engaged or you've been married for, what, less than five, six, seven years? I'd say up to ten years. Ten years. uh, This is practical stuff, as we have uh, just been demonstrating, and I hope you sell a million copies, Kay. Uh, Shirley and I love you and Charles and are thankful for what the Lord is doing in your life. Blessings to you, Kay. Give our love to Charles. Thank you. You know, men and women certainly communicate in different ways, don't we? That definitely is important to understand and remember as you interact with your spouse. That was the aha lesson that I took away from today's conversation, and I hope you found it useful as well. 
We've just heard the conclusion of this two-part discussion featuring Kay Coles James and our very own Dr. James Dobson here on Family Talk. Now, to learn more about Kay Coles James or to listen to any part of the conversation you may have missed, remember you can visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk and hear part one and part two in their entirety. Again, that's drjamesdobson.org forward slash family. Family Talk. You can listen online or you can also listen on the official Family Talk JDFI app. Easily share the program with friends and loved ones from that technology. It's free to download from your app store today. And on all of our official digital platforms, you will have access to literally thousands of Family Talk programs curated throughout the years, featuring the timeless truths and sage advice from Dr. Dobson and his esteemed colleagues. Before we leave, I have one brief announcement to share. Of course, last month during the month of June, we had a special matching grant in place of $300,000, and I am very excited to announce that all of your prayers and support have helped in a most significant way. Thanks to you, we met our match. Now we are able to increase our efforts and create more programs and materials for moms and dads and people everywhere. In addition, over the next few weeks, we will be explaining, sharing with you how you can get involved and come alongside us to support expecting parents, young families, and new mothers in need. I'm Roger Marsh, and from all of us here at the JDFI, we hope you have a peaceful and blessed weekend. Thanks for listening to Family Talk, and join us again Monday for another inspiring program. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.